This week's materials have highlighted the Church amidst the ongoings of the world in the 5th through 11th centuries. Throughout this presentation, we'll talk about how the material relates to contemporary Church, as well as how we can utilize these resources in both the mission of the Church and individualized faith and practices. We'll close with some of the lessons we've learned along the way and hope to spark a discussion amongst all of us, sharing what we've discovered this week. Let's get started by digging into how we're affected by the events happening between the 5th and 11th centuries. There were three major themes identified throughout the reading, which impacted early Christians and still impact contemporary Christians today. We can see the immediate effects of the early Christians' logical debates, the happenings of the external environment, and how they expressed their faith through art, as well as see how those actions have affected where we are today. As humans do, early Christians continued to interpret writings and thoughts differently and then debate the suggested opinions until a majority consensus was reached, typically based on what they believed to be scripturally sound. The first four ecumenical councils played a large role in not only determining the doctrine that was followed, but also in shaping the way doctrinal issues were and are solved. Through usually diplomatic debate and careful consideration, church leaders of the day worked through new teachings and ideas that were put forth. We can still see the remnants of their decisions in the widely held belief of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being one in modern Christianity. As Cook and Herzman discuss in the Medieval Worldview, Quote, the Mediterranean world, the heart of the Roman Empire, was divided by politics and religion, end quote. This led to even greater differences in the Eastern and Western churches. This is a fantastic example of how human culture can affect our religious views. In the Eastern Christianity podcast, the differences for these churches are described as the Western Roman church ascribing to a law-heavy interpretation, and the Eastern Church is focusing less on the human aspect and more on the theological thoughts of sharing the light of God and the unity with the divine. It's a simple example, but it helps to illuminate the fact that we as humans are affected by worldly events, such as the split of an empire. While the impact is unavoidable because we must live in this world, we do not have to let these events control us. As Christians, if we know the history of our faith, we are much more able to stand by our beliefs and keep them stable, regardless of what is happening in our external environment. Throughout this time period, we also see a rise in faith expressed in various art forms. While church leaders were meeting to logically discuss what beliefs churches would adhere to, Christians were finding new ways to express their beliefs through art, hymns, poetry, etc., some art forms, such as the hymns written by Ephraim, showed acceptance of the mystery of God. Most art pieces depicted biblical scenes. We still see Christian art in our faith today, from the early Christian art we've preserved throughout history to the new hymns that are created for us to sing and worship. The influence early Christians have had on contemporary Christianity isn't limited to the creative arts. There are also a number of congregational resources bestowed to us from their example. Not only do this week's materials illuminate the background of Christian faith and practice, but they also provide indispensable resources for the contemporary life and mission of the church. In fact, in many ways, the struggles, triumphs, and concerns of Eastern Christians in the 5th through 11th centuries resonate deeply with contemporary Christian experiences. Cultivating appreciation for the treasures of this era of church history may illuminate the richness of the Christian heritage of faith for contemporary believers as well as provide necessary correctives and counterweights to the current concerns and emphases of the church today. Perhaps the most pervasive and significant resources of this era for the contemporary church arise from the extensive attention given to Christology in the 4th through 6th centuries. Although a series of heated disagreements in this era regarding the nature, will, and person of Jesus threatened the unity of the church, the resultant definitions of Christ's being and work that emerged from these debates still govern, by and large, the shape of orthodoxy today. The conclusions of ecumenical councils at Nicaea in 325, Constantinople in 381, Ephesus in 431, and Chalcedon in 451, as well as many other councils and synods, give remarkable precision and vitality to the questions of Christ's full divinity and full humanity, while also preserving the mysteries inherent in these paradoxes. 
The Christological formations of the church in this era, particularly in the East, may be especially significant for contemporary American churches, where Christology is sometimes surprisingly undervalued. As Ferguson notes, churches who trace their roots primarily to Western Christianity inherit the more legal and practical emphases of the West on ecclesiology and anthropology, as opposed to Eastern emphases on the mysteries of God and Christ. In American Restoration Movement churches, such as the Churches of Christ, this may be especially apparent. As a recent article by Thomas Olbricht describes, the two basic foci of Restoration theology have been ecclesiology and humanity's role in soteriology. In fact, Olbricht arranges Christology as the seventh most significant subject in his rhetorical ordering of Church of Christ theological topics. If the life and mission of contemporary congregations is to be truly Christ-centered, then appropriating and applying the theological resources regarding Christ's person and work must be an essential practice of the church. In doing so, the church today may find abundant assets here in the doctrines of Christ hammered out by the church fathers and early medieval theologians, primarily in the East. Beyond its bounty of doctrinal resources, this era of Christian history also provides ample ecclesial and vocational resources to the contemporary church. For example, the contemporary church can learn much from the discipline and accountability affirmed in the Benedictine rule, set forth by Benedict of Nursia in the 6th century. Likewise, the variety and creativity of liturgical expressions in this era may provide fresh and theological rich language for contemporary worship. Moreover, understanding the history of relations between Christianity and Islam, which began in this era, can help inform the church's current conversations and responses to our Muslim neighbors. In short, contemporary congregations who look to this age of Christianity may find plentiful resources for deepening doctrinal and ecclesial expressions of faith. Some congregations may already include creedal recitations in their liturgy, which convey the richness of Christological language from this period. For those that do not, the familiarity of the preaching minister with these definitions of orthodoxy may allow him or her to integrate these concepts into the explication of biblical texts. Congregations could also benefit from integrating artifacts from this era into a spiritual disciplines class. For example, congregants could be encouraged to practice hesychastic prayer or to follow the prayer patterns of a Benedictine monastery for a day. Creative opportunities abound for contemporary churches to utilize the rich resources of this period of church history. The 5th through 11th centuries also provided a wealth of resources for modern Christians to utilize on a personal level. This week's assigned resources are valuable in the formation of personal beliefs, in learning creative ways to express faith in worship, and in learning to posture oneself during prayer. In Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, God declared, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. There is much about God that is mystery, and yet since the beginning of time, humanity has labored to arrive at a logical definition of him. In the church during the 5th and 6th centuries, this pursuit focused on defining the nature of Jesus Christ. Was he really fully human? If so, how was he also fully divine? How did the human and divine natures come to exist in the same individual? Letters exchanged between Cyril of Alexandria and Nestorius, as well as the tome by Pope Leo, along with other documents written during the 5th and 6th centuries, help to explain the various understandings of the dual nature of Christ. Ferguson's chapters give a good summary of each of the views as well, and one could easily begin to form their own understanding of the nature of Christ by a slow and careful study of these texts. However, we cannot forget that God is mystery and will never fully be explained. Perhaps this is why the definition of the Council of Chalcedon is written as it is. For, as Ferguson points out, it preserved the mystery rather than explaining it. As you meditate on the nature of Christ, that he is both fully man and fully God, give yourself permission to accept this mystery without requiring a logical explanation of how our great God accomplished such a wondrous thing. In a time so dominated by official writings, doctrinal statements, and anathemas, beautiful works of poetry began to surface that brought depth and beauty to expressions of faith. 
The hymns of Ephraim that were included in this week's resources gave us a glimpse into the beliefs of the composer and could serve as a useful tool in focusing one's thoughts on the story of God. Much like the Psalms, these hymns can be used as a very personal expression of faith through prayer or personal worship. They also provide a beautiful example for us to mimic as we learn to express our faith, beliefs, and worship through creative means. Another creative outlet for Christians was that of painted artwork. Beautiful depictions of biblical scenes were used not only for decoration, but also for teaching. By the 8th century, however, these art pieces became much more venerated among the church. There was a huge debate over the use of paintings, or icons as they were known. Was the image being worshipped, or the one depicted in the image? The icons were even thought to have miraculous powers. Several times during the 8th and 9th centuries, the use of icons was forbidden, and tragically, a great number of paintings were destroyed. Eventually, the practice was allowed a permanent place in the life of the church. Artwork can still be an impactful part of a person's faith story. Some understand and express their faith through the written word, others through music or dance, and still others through visual art. Kept in its proper place as a teaching tool or an expression of faith, but never the object of our loyalty or devotion, Art can provide a powerful connection between God and man. The icons pictured in this week's resources provide a beautiful testimony of the faith of our predecessors, and as we observe them and study them, we worship right along with the Christians of centuries gone by. One last resource that can be very useful in the personal practice of our faith is the hesychastic method of prayer. From this method, we can glean important lessons about posturing ourselves during prayer. We learn to be aware of the pervading presence of God, to detach ourselves from physical distractions and preferences, to be still in body and mind, and most importantly, to position ourselves in humility before God and man. As we intentionally practice these things, we find ourselves in a posture in heart, soul, mind, and strength that allows communion with our God and invites him to be our one and only Lord. The rich history of the church has many lessons for the church of today. We learn that as perspectives change, doctrine changes. We learn the value of knowing our history, where we came from. We learn to practice humility and to focus our conversations on issues pertaining to salvation. And finally, we learn that we, too, will contribute to the history of Christianity. The doctrine of the church is important. The New Testament clearly warns against false doctrine. It is essential to remember that just as the Christian life is a process, and a process takes time, so is the formation of doctrine. Growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord is not done overnight. The councils of Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus, and Chalcedon were instrumental in establishing doctrine concerning the nature of God and Christ, taking place over a span of 125 years. In our churches, we must be patient with those who hold to doctrine that is different than ours and realize that the so-called biblical view is not always as clear as we would like it to be. A great example of patience can be seen in the second letter of Nestorius to Cyril. He says, quote, I pass over the insults against us contained in your extraordinary letter. They will, I think, be cured by my patience and by the answer which events will offer in the course of time. Thus we find Nestorius extending patience and humility, but also standing up for those things that he sees as important. Jeff Childers stated in The Christian Crossroads of Tradition and Culture, quote, When we discover that history plays a big role in all our decisions, no matter how pure or innovative we believe ourselves to be, it can leave us feeling as if the past has a stranglehold on us. Yet we are unavoidably the heirs to our past, no more able to escape from history than children are able to erase the evidence of their parents' influence. The church has a past. And we must recognize that the church of today is greatly influenced by the past 2,000 years of Christianity. This week's readings provide a great example of this. Ferguson says, quote, The fourth to six sessions of the Council of Chalcedon dealt with the question of drawing up a new definition of faith, which many were reluctant to do. It was agreed that the faith was to be based on the Creed of Nicaea, as confirmed by Constantinople, expounded by Cyril at Ephesus, and set forth in Leo's Tome. Furthermore, the church during this time period began to appeal to the earlier fathers as well as the scriptures. 
Byzantine theologians often argued by using quotations from the fathers. Finally, the definition of the Council of Chalcedon serves as an example of the discussion at hand. It says, quote, But one and the same Son and only begotten God, the Word, Lord Jesus Christ, even as the prophets from earliest times spoke of him, and our Lord Jesus Christ himself taught us, and the creed of the fathers has handed down to us. The definition of the Council of Chalcedon recognized the impact that the creed of the fathers had on their present dilemma. Whether we realize it or not, our thought process and decisions are impacted by prior decisions and teachings. It is wise to consider what others have said and to realize that we are influenced by church history. We must always ask ourselves this important question, on what is our faith based, as we continue to recognize the influence of our church fathers. During the 5th and 6th centuries, the church was plagued with problems causing many divisions. Interestingly, Ferguson says the irony of the situation is that modern students conclude that the Chalcedonians, the Henophysites, and the Church of the East were essentially trying to say the same thing about Jesus Christ. Their different starting points gave different formulations that opponents found unacceptable. Before disagreeing with those who hold other views, we must look for common ground. We should examine both claims and make sure that they are not saying the same things in different ways. The Church of the 5th and 6th centuries provides a great example for Christians today in dealing with controversy, in that, as Ferguson says, all the major controversies may be seen as concerned with salvation. In Cyril's second letter, he says, But I turn to a subject more fitting to myself, and remind you as a brother in Christ always to be very careful about what you say to the people in matters of teaching and of your thought on the faith. Although much dissension occurred, the issues deserved conversation. Are we wasting time in the church today by discussing issues that are not really issues? One of the greatest benefits of studying church history is to see the contributions people have made to theological discussion throughout the centuries. The influence of Islam motivated Christians to express theological beliefs in a variety of ways. Others contributed to the theological discussion by copying Greek manuscripts. In fact, according to Ferguson, the 10th and 11th centuries have left us more manuscripts and mosaics than any other period. Many Christians sacrificed in different ways for the faith. In the early church, it was often their lives. Later, it became their time and energy. Consider how you might contribute to the church and to Christian history. As we consider some lessons the church can take from reading of church life in the 5th and 6th centuries, we should recognize that this is a small sampling. However, the lessons discussed are vital for the church to implement. The study of Christian history clearly illuminates our understanding of the background of contemporary Christian faith, the church, and human culture. Studying the church of the 5th and 6th centuries enhances congregational life and mission, and the primary source material from this time contributes to further personal devotion and practice. There are many practical lessons to be learned, and our prayer is that you will implement the ideas, concepts, and lessons discussed in this presentation.